The case of Oscar Slater was like something out of a crime novel. On a cold, rainy December night just before Christmas in 1908, Marion Gilchrist, an 82-year-old, wealthy, reclusive Scottish woman, was murdered brutally, blood to death, in her opulent Glasgow flat during 10 minutes when her maid had stepped out to buy the evening paper. Now, when the maid came back and the police were called, although Marion Gilchrist was a great collector of jewelry and had a personal collection that in today's American money would be worth nearly half a million dollars, despite the presence of all of this masses of jewelry, the maid testified that only a single piece was missing, a brooch in the shape of a crescent moon set along its length with diamonds. Woe betide Oscar Slater. By pure coincidence, he had recently pawned a brooch of his, a crescent moon set along its length with diamonds, although the police ascertained within a week that the two brooches were different, they pursued Slater anyway, knowing he was not guilty. He was tried in the spring of 1909 and sentenced to hang in a detail that still gives me chills. He literally had made arrangements for his own burial 48 hours before he was Slater to hang. He was reprieved, his sentence was commuted to life at hard labor, and he was dispatched to His Majesty's prison, Peterhead, this Dickensian Victorian fortress on the raw northeast coast of Scotland. It was later known as Scotland's Gulag, and there he stayed at hard labor in the prison quarry and eating this Dickensian diet of broth and gruel for 18 and a half years. But why does this case, from over 100 years ago, require another look now? Every Conan Doyle bio has anywhere from a paragraph to a chapter on Conan Doyle's involvement in the Oscar Slater case, which of course began with this terrible Glasgow murder in 1908, through Slater's conviction the next year, through Conan Doyle's entry into the case in 1912 and the scathing indictment he wrote about that through Slater's smuggling out a message in the mouth of a fellow prisoner saying go see Conan Doyle in 1925 he'd been rotting in jail for over a decade by then to Conan Doyle's winning Slater's freedom in 1927 so the case plus its aftermath spanned pretty much the last two decades of Conan Doyle's life Join us as author Marguerite Fox explores the story behind immigrant Oscar Slater, the blue wall that sought to bring him down at any cost, the fear and suspicion that taints the human mind, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's attitude about the whole case. Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetirregulars.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 149. Conan Doyle for the defense. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. Your home's the meddler. Home's the busybody. Home's the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we discuss goings on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the bigger street irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. 
So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Oh, hi there, and welcome once again to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees, where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And we are panting our way to August, the dog days of summer. Now, which which canonical canine do you think would be most appropriate for the dog days of summer? Well, the temptation is to say the Hound of the Baskervilles, mm. but I like Toby. I'm, I'm very fond of Toby. I like that. I, I'm thinking of the, you know, that hang dogged bloodhound look. Uh, that, that could do it. That could, and of course, there was a, there was a bloodhound also used in, um, the, the, the missing three quarter. Uh, there's that famous, uh, both, uh, both, uh, Paget and, and, uh, Steele famously drew the picture of uh, Holmes being led by the uh, the hound on the the leash that was taught um you know as as he was uh, tracing i think it was Dr. Leslie Armstrong through the streets right yeah i like that steel picture although it really does show Holmes probably not particularly well attired for where he was walking, but uh, I thought it was <laughs> nicely done nonetheless. <laughs> Indeed. And, you know, the, the steel drawing has that, that leash so tight uh, that it almost seems like it's a stick that, that uh, stands between Holmes and the dog. <laughs> you know, but well, that's neither here nor there. We are here, of course, to, Speak with a celebrated author whom you will meet in just a moment. But just so you know, the show notes for this episode are available at ihose.co slash ihose149. You can reach us on ihearofsherlock.com in general. Uh, make sure you sign up for updates there. Make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or um, Google Podcasts or wherever you're listening to us right now. Make sure you get notified and updated when we update the show. Of course, we are here twice a month, uh, the 15th and the 30th, and we are with you weekly over on Trifles. You can find that show at SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. We are I Hear of Sherlock on all of the social webs, and you can reach us via email at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com, and we would love to hear from you. And you know who else would love to hear from you? Who, who? Well, this time around, our friends at the Wessex Press, and we would remind you to please frequent our sponsors. Helping them helps us, so do all you can. Here in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we have just marked the Festival of the Seven Sleepers, those hardy souls who entered a cave in the year 250 and slept until they were awakened in 479. But you won't worry about oversleeping when your bedtime reading includes the science fiction worlds of Arthur Conan Doyle and H.G. Wells by Dana Martin Batori. These essays explore landmark science fiction, including the last Professor Challenger story, When the World Screamed, and it's available right now at wessexpress.com. And around and around and around they go, heel to heel and toe to toe. Now's the time to dance into summer and enjoy a new book from the Wessex Press. Choose yours today. Oh, those golden days of yesteryear in the sublime area of Essex. Wessex, not Essex. Yes. Now, right. wouldn't that be Wessex. neat if there were the Essex Press? Oh, the Essex Press. Or the Sussex Press. Boy, yeah. this could get confusing rather quickly. Or if there was a merger, you know, the Sussex, Essex, Wessex Press. <laughs> All the Limited. sex presses. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. Well... Let's get away from that and over to our interview guest. Uh, 
Recently retired as a senior writer for the New York Times, Marguerite Fox is considered one of the foremost explanatory writers and literary stylists in American journalism today. As a member of the newspaper's celebrated obituary news department, she's written front-page send-offs for some of the leading cultural figures of our age. And Conan Doyle for the Defense, her new book, is in many ways a fond, belated obituary for the long-overlooked Oscar Slater, an immigrant everyman treated inexcusably by history, and you'll hear exactly why in just a moment. Fox's previous book, The Riddle of the Labyrinth, won the William Soroyan International Prize for Writing. She lives in Manhattan with her husband, the writer and critic George Robinson, and she is here to speak to us about Conan Doyle for the Defense, the true story of a sensational British murder, a quest for justice, and the world's most famous detective writer. Marguerite, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Of, of all the podcasts in all the towns in all the world, this is the one I am most <laughs> delighted to be on. I love it. Uh, well, lest uh, Sam get going on the piano there, uh, why don't we delve into the question that we start every interview with and ask you uh, how you first came to know Sherlock Holmes? I don't have a specific memory, but it's a very safe bet that it happened, as for so many of us, in childhood. My father was a physicist and a mathematician, so he adored anything to do with logic. And a lot of the stories that he and I read when I was an even younger child were things like Lewis Carroll's Alice books, because, of course, Carroll was a logician and a mathematician, and my father absolutely loved that kind of logic, that kind of linguistic play, wherever he could find it in literature. And so I strongly suspect, uh, reasoning abductively, that uh, it was from him that I was introduced to the master. So tell us about the link then that finally exposed you to Arthur Conan Doyle and this case of Oscar Slater. Well, this is something your listenership will appreciate more than any other group for whom I've answered that question. The origin of Conan Doyle for the defense goes back more than 30 years to when I had just left graduate school in the West and settled in New York as a young person in my 20s. I was making my daily commute to a rather uninspiring entry-level job in book publishing and the book I had brought with me to read on the subway that week was John Dixon Carr's 1949 bio of Conan Doyle. Ah. And as many of you will remember, toward the end of the book, when we're getting into the 20th century history, Carr says, almost as an aside in this very cavalier way, in effect, oh, by the way, Sir Arthur also made the real-life investigation of a wrongful conviction for a terrible murder and using the methods of the master freed this wrongfully convicted Jewish immigrant who had rotted in jail for almost 20 years. Well, I almost dropped the book in the middle of the A-train. I thought, my God, the creator of Sherlock Holmes himself played Holmes, successfully writing a scandalous wrongful conviction, why in the world isn't this case better known, at least in the States? However, I had not yet even gone to journalism school, much less embarked on a career as a writer, so I was not at all in a position to do something about it. I filed it away in my brain attic in a dusty recess toward the back, Fast forward almost 30 years to 2013 when my previous book, The Riddle of the Labyrinth, was finished and I was casting about for a new subject for a narrative nonfiction book. I aired out the dusty corner of my brain attic and by then I had written two books. I was a senior writer at the New York Times and I thought, at last, now I'm in a position to tell the Oscar Slater story. I know a lot of our listeners are going to be fascinated with this, but how does one come to become an obituary writer for the New York Times? 
It is very true that the child has yet to be born who comes home from first grade clutching a theme in his little fist that says, when I grow up, I want to be an obituary writer. Uh, I fell into it, as most of us do. Uh, I am certainly old enough to be aware that historically the obit department was Siberia in every newsroom at every newspaper across America. It was where they sent you if you messed up on a grown-up part of the paper, but they didn't quite have enough on you to fire you. And it was also where they typically farmed people out to pasture when they were judged to be a whisker away from needing an obit themselves. Happily, that has changed, particularly at the New York Times. I first joined the Times 24 years ago in 1994, and I spent my first 10 years there as a copy editor on the Times Sunday Book Review. And while it was a wonderful job being surrounded by books and lively, smart colleagues, I had very much been uh, trained for at that point and been banking on a writing career. So I began contributing advanced obits to the section on a freelance basis because there is this Sisyphean need for obits of the newsworthy undead, the people whose work is so complex and so rich, so vast, that we don't want to have to get caught short writing them on deadline. Although, of course, the gods being non-cooperative in this respect, very often we do. But obit departments always have a need for journalists from throughout the newsroom to contribute advance obits. And so 10 years of doing that go by. In 2004, a staff job in the obit section opened up. And because I by then had a track record, I was lucky enough to get it. And and along the way, you know, you had a lovely piece in the Times at the end of June. You have written, you reported more than 1,400 obituaries That's for, right. for the Times. And That's now right. you That's are conservative. And, yeah. and now you are a full, now you're a hero and an idol to many of our listeners who've also dreamed of this. You're following your long held dream of writing books exclusively. Well, one of the things I loved in uh, the piece that you had in the Times at the end of June, and now we should say that you have been away from the Times for three whole weeks. Right. So, this is my three-week anniversary. So. Right. <laughs> so I wonder how – so I'm, I'm curious how it feels, but I also want to point out that in this great piece you had at the end, uh, in the Times, you wrote, and so it is the frisson makers, history's backstage players – whom we writers love best of all. Those unsung heroes and heroines are rarely household names, yet in ways large and small, they've changed history. They're people who, for good or ill, have put a wrinkle in the social fabric. And that that really sort of gets us right to Oscar Slater in a way. Uh, He does indeed, or he, he, poor, hapless guy, had a, a terrible, seemingly permanent wrinkle that he couldn't get out of put in for him. So, so when you, when you, when you revisited this sort of corner of your, um, mind and said to yourself, okay, you know, I'm looking for another nonfiction subject. What about Conan Doyle and Oscar Slater? How did, how did you sort of begin your, your journey? Cause it's quite a ta- quite a thing to pursue, particularly so many decades later. That's right. Well, first of all, I read a lot of secondary sources as you folks well know better than civilians do every Conan Doyle bio, and there are, what, dozens, if not scores of them, has anywhere from a paragraph to a chapter on Conan Doyle's involvement in the Oscar Slater case, which, of course, began with this terrible Glasgow murder in 1908, through Slater's conviction the next year, through Conan Doyle's entry into the case in 1912, and the scathing indictment he wrote about that, through uh, Slater's smuggling out a message uh, in the mouth of a fellow prisoner saying, go see Conan Doyle in 1925. He'd been rotting in jail for over a decade by then to Conan Doyle's winning Slater's Freedom in 1927. So the case spanned, and the case plus its aftermath spanned pretty much the last two decades of Conan Doyle's life. But I was staggered to discover that although every bio pays lip service to the case, In the United States, there is not a single freestanding book that I have ever been made aware of on the case. And even in Britain, 
there were a couple of pretty good early books on the case. Of course, the Scottish journalist William Ruffhead did four editions of his masterful book, The Trial of Oscar Slater, that is uh, full of transcripts and addenda and so on. Peter Hunt's book uh, is also quite good. The more recent books, in my opinion, the, the few that there are in Britain are of what I call the grassy knoll variety, speculating rather breathlessly with, again, adducing little evidence. Uh, it would make uh, the master blanch in horror, but uh, speculating rather wildly and seemingly randomly on who did kill Marion Gilchrist, the rich old lady who was murdered in Glasgow in 1908. As I say in my book, if Conan Doyle knew well enough, which of course he did when he entered the case in 1912, that his job was not to find out who done it, but to prove who had not done it, then my job 110 years after the crime uh, is certainly not one that should be directed toward identifying and indicting a culprit. It's, it would only be the product of undiluted speculation. But once I had read these secondary sources and convinced myself that there was a real niche that this book should fill, because particularly in the States, the case sort of fell into a crevice in history and was largely forgotten, then I went to the primary sources. The murder took place in Glasgow. There was a change of venue to the for the trial, which took place in Edinburgh, so there are very, very deep archives in both of those cities of trial transcripts, witness statements, police reports, of letters including Conan Doyle's uh, two-decade-long correspondence on the case, and most wonderfully and most movingly, very nearly every letter Oscar Slater sent and received in his 18 and a half years in Peterhead Prison in northern Scotland. And those were a treasure trove, and I make no claim to have discovered them. They've been there for the taking. They've been open to the public for quite a number of years now. But the few recent books on the case in Britain have made use of them almost not at all. And to me, one of the of all of the many ways in which Slater was wronged, the last way in which he was wronged was he was wronged by history, because chroniclers of his case left him almost as a hollow absence, a cipher at the center of his own story, as I say. And through these beautiful letters, through his loving family in Germany, this kind of barely working class, but loving Jewish family, his parents never lost faith in him, never stopped loving him. Then when the, you see the parents age and die because he's in prison for so long, then his sisters start writing and he's in prison for so long that then his sister's children start writing. So you see three generations of family life and of Oscar Slater's own life through these beautiful, beautiful letters. So those I was particularly grateful to get from the archive. Hmm. So for our listeners that haven't read the book yet and perhaps who aren't as familiar with this case in Conan Doyle's history, can you give us a brief synopsis as to what happened and, and why it was that Oscar Slater was accused and convicted of this crime that uh, he did not, in fact, commit? Absolutely. And therein lies the tragedy of the whole story. On a cold, rainy December night, just before Christmas in 1908, Marion Gilchrist, an 82-year-old, wealthy, reclusive Scottish woman, was murdered brutally, bludgeoned to death in her opulent Glasgow flat during 10 minutes when her maid had stepped out to buy the evening paper. Now, when the maid came back and the police were called, although Marion Gilchrist was a great collector of jewelry and had a personal collection that in today's American money would be worth nearly half a million dollars and had it secreted in odd hiding places all around her department, her apartment, things pinned behind drapes, uh, tucked into coat pockets and whatnot. Despite the presence of all of this masses of jewelry, the maid testified that only a single piece was missing. 
a brooch in the shape of a crescent moon set along its length with diamonds. Woe betide Oscar Slater. By pure coincidence, he had recently pawned a brooch of his, one that he had bought for his lady companion, a crescent moon set along its length with diamonds, although the police ascertained within a week that the two brooches were different and, as Corrin Doyle said, therefore the very bottom of the case against Slater should have dropped out, they pursued Slater anyway, knowing he was not guilty. He was tried in the spring of 1909 and sentenced to hang in a detail that still gives me chills. He literally had made arrangements for his own burial by the time a reprieve came. There was enough public sentiment and public doubt about the case that a petition was got up. It went all the way to King Edward VII, who was the only person authorized to grant a reprieve. Shocking as it sounds, there was no criminal appeals court in Scotland then, not in England then either. Um, Very distressing to us today. So a death sentence really meant you were going to die. 48 hours before he was slated to hang, he was reprieved, his sentence was commuted to life at hard labor, and he was dispatched to His Majesty's prison, Peterhead, this Dickensian Victorian fortress on the raw northeast coast of Scotland. I've been up there. It's cold and raining all the time. It was later known as Scotland's Gulag. It has a reputation as being one of the most brutal penal institutions in all of Britain. And there he stayed at hard labor, breaking up granite in the prison quarry and eating this Dickensian diet of broth and gruel for 18 and a half years. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's, it's almost cliched, uh, in, in that regard, but, um, and this is, this is what happened. Uh, and it, it was a, a tragedy, really. And one of the things that, that struck me as I got to the end of the book and read the acknowledgements, you mentioned that it was, uh, Hillary Redman, your, uh, editor at Random House, glimpsed the heart of the story. What, what is it that she kind of picked out and said, you know, this is probably what you want to pursue as you're, as you're writing this book? How did she frame it for you? Well, there were several things. And she's a terrific editor. She's been my editor for my last two books. Um, one thing she had me do was put in much more about what his life in prison was. And of course, because I had been living with the material for several years at that point and was so close to it to me, the conditions in His Majesty's prison Peterhead seemed sort of self-evident. But of course, as she so rightly reminded me, other people won't even have heard of this prison, much less what goes on inside. And so I did a lot more research on conditions. I found uh, inmates who were including a political prisoner, John McLean, who's a great hero of Scottish socialism. He was there for sedition uh, around World War I, time that overlapped with Slater's tenure there. And he wrote uh, all sorts of pamphlets about how bad the conditions were. Those were a godsend. Uh, I actually went up there on a second trip to Scotland just at the end of last year. It is a fascinating place. It stayed open as a prison from its inception in 1888 until 1913, when it was known widely as one of the worst penal institutions in Britain. It is now a museum and absolutely fascinating. They make no bones about how terrible the prison's history was. And indeed, I had the uh, nervous-making privilege of standing in the very cell that Oscar Slater lived in for 18 and a half years. And it is small. It's about six by seven. You can barely stretch out in it. Amazing. To get back to something you asked me about vis-a-vis the Glasgow police, why Slater? This, too, was the beating heart of the story that both Hillary, my editor, and I homed in on kind of uh, simultaneously, you know, each without realizing the other was also on that track. And it was a very, very good thing we did. Why Slater? Out of all the people in Glasgow, you've had this brutal murder. You have reason to suspect a man because he's reported to have pawned a brooch believed to be the one that was stolen. Okay, that's a 
not unreasonable assumption. You take the maid to the pawn shop the day after the murder, which is what the cops did, and the pawnbroker shows gets out Slater's brooch, and the maid says, oh, no, that's not my mistress's brooch. The uh, mistress's brooch was set with one row of diamonds. Slater's was set with three, so they were very clearly not the same, and it had been in continuous pawn since a month before the murder, a month, in other words, before Oscar Slater ever heard the name of the victim, Marion Gilchrist. Yet, the $64,000 question, given that, why did police and prosecutors in Glasgow choose to hound Slater anyway and hound him almost into the grave? And the reason is this. It was a high-profile case, just as we always see on Law & Order and all those shows we like, the cops were under huge pressure to close it. It was a media sensation. A rich old lady, spinster lady, murdered brutally in a nice part of town. It absolutely distilled to a fine concentration all of the kind of anxieties about class and modernity and crime and the tensions of urban life that were very much playing out in cities in the late 19th and early 20th century, Glasgow being no exception. And so in Slater, although they knew he was innocent, they had a sublime suspect. Why? Because he was what the historian Peter Gay calls the convenient other. He was a foreigner at a time of rising xenophobia, a Jew at a time of rising anti-Semitism. He was reported to earn his living as a gambler at a time of class consciousness, and this was a mur murder of a very high-class woman, and he was tarred with the reputation, although it was never proved, of being a pimp at a time still when these Victorian and post-Victorian sensibilities about sexual mores were still alive and well. So Slater was as if sent from central casting, the epitome of the very kind of man the police of Glasgow in 1909 wanted off their streets anyway. So they simply, as the Scottish journalist William Park actually proved with Conan Doyle's help uh, in the late 1920s, they simply made the very conscious decision to ensnare him in this existing case anyway and thereby kill two birds with one stone. Wow. Well, you know, I, I know you, you mentioned this in the uh, in the introduction. Uh, as, as much as we like to think of ourselves as uh, having become more civilized and recognizing that that kind of uh, behavior, that kind of uh, overreach by the authorities, is in our past, uh, there are still some parallels around today, even as we speak, That's right. that are going on, which and makes this all the more relevant. Little did I think, uh, I've lived with this material for about six years, and little did I think when I started six years ago that this story of anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, and the ultimately the enactment or threatened enactment of laws to keep immigrants out altogether or at least reduce their numbers in Britain Little did I suspect that it would be so painfully relevant to our own time. And I think that realization for me helped answer a question of, here's this extraordinary story of Conan Doyle being personally involved in writing this great wrong, a crusade at the center of which is a sensational murder. This, the question lingered for me for all six years I worked on this. Why on earth? Wasn't this case better known? And my conjecture is this. When Conan Doyle died in 1930, and at mid-century, there started to be the first wave of a number of mostly very admiring biographies of him. My conjecture is that these mid-century writers kind of discarded the Slater case as this dusty Edwardian relic. And yet the, the savageries toward civil liberties by the Glasgow cops and prosecutors, the racism, the xenophobia, the framing of an immigrant simply because he was different from the the culture in power 
I'm sure they thought, oh, those are things of the past. That doesn't happen to enlightened 20th, 20th century folk. And, you know, all I have to say to enlightened 21st century folk is look around. Yeah, undoubtedly. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, look, yeah, look around. Look around, indeed. I mean, one of the one of the things that comes across when you read this book, which we should remind our listeners is Conan Doyle for the Defense, just published by Random House, is is what I pick up is is your affection or admiration for Conan Doyle. And in the book, you point out that um, in one of many anecdotes and uh, insightful observations about Conan Doyle that there came a point in his life where he defined um, the three tests of a gentleman, his mm-hmm. his chivalry to women, his rectitude in finance, and his courtesy to the lower orders. Um, tell us a little bit about, about how you view Conan Doyle. I mean, I note that back in on your way to graduate school, you were reading the Dixon Carr biography. And and how and and what do you think about his getting the way he got engaged in this later case? Well, that's one of the things that fascinated me the deeper I got into this case, and something I really want to remind readers, perhaps especially American readers, about Conan Doyle is remembered and loved and venerated today for the home stories as well he should be. But he is, I think, somewhat less well remembered, perhaps greatly less well remembered as being the social crusader. And of course, the first thing that has to be remembered is certainly by the first dec- decade of the 20th century when this case began. He was one of the f- most famous men in public life, not only in Britain, but in the world. And so his weighing in on any issue carried a tremendous amount of gravitas. He was this tremendously moral person. That said, he was far from perfect. He was kind of echt Victorian man in many ways. I think the fact that he grew up dirt poor and not an Englishman, it's important to remember he himself was Scottish, grew up dirt poor, the son of this alcoholic, mentally ill father who couldn't support the large family in Edinburgh, you know, struggled through economically to get through medical school. He never forgot where he came from in that sense. And he was absolutely committed to being a champion of the downtrodden. He was this kind of medieval knight in shining armor. He was almost like a character out of one of the um, history narratives that he also wrote, for which, of course, he hoped to be better remembered than for Holmes. And obviously, history has not borne him out. It's probably a good thing. But um, he certainly was not without Victorian prejudices. He clearly was influenced by this, um, the anthropological view of reading character by the shape of someone's head. There's a passage from his memoir, Memories and Adventures, that I quote in my book where he's on a visit to New York and he goes to Sing Sing Prison just north of New York City. And he says, um, occasionally among the inmates, I would see a kindly or even a good face. One wonders how they got there. So he was, you know, very much a product of the way people were socialized in the Victorian period to think about criminals. He was largely able, however, to transcend that because his basic humanism trumped, you should pardon the expression, that verb has been ruined for us now, uh, his basic humanism trumped this kind of narrow Victorian socialization that everyone had back then. And so Slater was on, one of only many causes that he championed his, in his life, that George Adalji, wrongful conviction, is of course much better known. He also wrote a book about um, the Belgian depredations in the Congo, what today would be called human rights violations, perhaps even genocide. He was agitated to, for divorce reform to uh, make divorce laws more favorable to women who were trapped in what now would be called abusive marriages. He ran twice for parliament, although uh, he was not successful either time. During the Boer War, he put on his doctor hat again and actually went and worked in a 
military field hospital in South Africa. And there's this wonderful quote uh, that's in the book, and it's, it's just Conan Doyle to the letter with the god, king, and country. Um, he says, um, speaking of the, the British soldiers in that war, for them the bullets, for us the microbes, and for both the honor of the flag. So he really was a man of passionate convictions, very moral, who absolutely lived by that moral code and tried to impose it on the world. And we're just going to pause here a minute for a brief word from our sponsor. You'll want to listen closely before you hit that fast forward button this time. If you've been with us before, you've heard our extolling of the Baker Street Journal as the premier publication for Sherlockian scholarship, where professionals and amateurs alike have been writing their treatises about the Sherlock Holmes stories since 1946. And we're not going to stop now. The journal is the place where you can find a wide variety of writing, updates, and thoughts about the great detective and his friend and colleague. But now, now you can do it on a new site. That's right, the classic site BakerStreetJournal.com, a site that came into being in 2001, is being retired. Although nothing ever disappears completely from the Internet. There's a new site, BakerStreetIrregulars.com, where you can find all things related to the Baker Street Irregulars, including the dozens of books from the VSI Press, events that you can participate in, and, of course, the Baker Street Journal itself. The format will look familiar. We didn't say the BSI was a design shop, so you should be able to feel your way around the links. You might be surprised at what you find. So go ahead and be a street Arab, and go everywhere and see everything on BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. And and what was uh, the path that took him to this later case? How did that come about? What is almost certain is uh, after Slater was convicted in 1909, his lawyers were still working behind the scenes on his behalf, although since there was no appeals court, they were very hamstrung in what they were able to do. But it's pretty clear that in late 1911 or early 1912, Conan Doyle was uh, entered the case at the behest of one of Slater's lawyers. And again, this the, this shows the duality of Conan Doyle in a nutshell. Being this good Victorian, eminently moral man, he he deplored what he knew of Slater's life. And pretty much everyone knew that he was supposedly a pimp. Um, Conan Doyle actually calls him in his book in support of Slater, a disreputable rolling stone of a man. Yet, as Conan Doyle also wrote, the more he read of the case, the more horrified he became and the more persuaded he became that a grave injustice had been done. And again, he was such a moral man, such a man who not only talked the talk, but really lived by his ardent convictions that the imperative for justice and for righting this terrible wrongful conviction superseded any personal distaste he had for someone who lived the way Slater allegedly lived. It's absolutely fascinating, you know, that the these aspects of Conan Doyle's life and the way that you've gone into the background and brought all of this back to life again and the research that you've done. The wonderful thing about the book Many wonderful things about the book and the fact that it's it's actually a real book. I mean, it's just beautifully laid out and there's some fabulous illustrations here. But you you um, have obviously gone back. You said you've made uh, at least several trips uh, back to Scotland and so on. But you found the uh, many of the original notes, you know, that that first note, the note, I think, that Slater smuggled out of prison. Um, that was extraordinary. I actually held that in my hand. In 1925, when Slater had been breaking up granite at Peterhead since 1909, he managed a fellow prisoner whom he, who had become his friend, a man named William Gordon, uh, who was in for presumably a less serious crime because he got there well after Slater but was paroled well before. 
Uh, so I think he was only doing a short stretch. This man, William Gordon, was paroled in January 1925. And as I say in the book, he probably would have passed into history unremarked. He was just a guy, um, except for the invaluable asset that he wore dentures. And under his dentures, the day he was paroled, was this note written on brown tissue paper that I was later told was probably pattern-making paper from the prison tailor shop. Uh, as the man who runs the prison museum says, it was just lying around. Any prisoner could pick pick up scraps. Written in pencil on this brown tissue paper, the paper was furled up into a tiny pellet, and then rolled around that was a scrap of glazed paper that Slater lifted from the bookbinding shop in prison to keep it dry. It was popped under William Gordon's gums. His dentures were popped over it. And although, of course, he was searched up and down and every which way when he was paroled from Peterhead, no one thought to look at his gums. And so this message was spirited into the world. Uh, Slater had slipped it to William Gordon at a meeting of the Prison Debating Society. And what did the message say? It said, among other things, go see Conan Doyle. Gordon did. Uh, Conan Doyle's son, Adrian, said he later remembered this convict showing up with the message. And so in 1925, Conan Doyle, who had not been active in the Slater case for about 10 years, was moved to pick up the case one last time. And by this time, I think enough time had gone by since the original crime, the tide of public sentiment towards Slater was starting to turn. He was now, you know, in the, as news reports of him in prison reached the public, it was clear he was alone and aging and, you know, really a broken man. I think a public sentiment had shifted just enough to give Conan Doyle entree, give him a pry bar, as it were. And so he enlisted the aid of the Scottish journalist William Park, who did another investigation, wrote a book that Conan Doyle edited every page of and Conan Doyle personally published through his own publishing house, the Psychic Press, which published most of his spiritualist work at that time. And that finally was enough for Slater's sentence to be commuted at the end of 1927. Now, there is a rather sad and painful epilogue where there was a rift between Slater, now free, and his great champion, Conan Doyle, in 1928. Yes, yeah, that is a, a very sad outcome. It, it wasn't something I expected, and when I was at the end of my initial research at the National Records of Scotland in Edinburgh, which has vast files on every court proceeding relating to the case. Toward closing time, I came across, you know, that last folder in the firebox, and it had a heading that brought me up short. It was unthinkable. It was a legal case, and the name of the case was Conan Doyle v. Slater. I thought, how could that be? I thought, I don't want to deal with this. I'm going to go back to my hotel. I'm going to go to sleep, and when I wake up, this troublesome file won't be there. It'll all have been a bad dream. And of course, when I went back the next day, it was there, and I had to deal with it. What happened was this. When uh, Slater was released in 1927, and again in 1928, largely through Conan Doyle's agitation, his case was formally reviewed by a five-judge panel and the conviction was actually quashed or overturned, as we would say. So he was given a clean slate. He then received £6,000 compensation from the British government, which was a lot of money in 1928. And Conan Doyle, again, ever the man of honor, demanded, not for himself, but demanded that the various people who had worked on the case, um, his lawyers principally for the, the appeal and the reversal of the conviction, um, certain journalists whom Conan Doyle had enlisted to do legwork, Conan Doyle insisted that they be paid. And he, Conan Doyle, had paid them provisionally. And when Slater got his compensatory monetary award, Conan Doyle insisted as a matter of principle that he be reimbursed. Slater would have none of it. He was a threadbare 
immigrant all his life, had lived the last 18 and a half years of his life in prison, and he felt he was entitled to every penny of the money and he was going to hang on to it. Conan Doyle, he knew, was a rich man. He could well afford the several hundred pounds he had laid out. And what Slater didn't understand was, again, it was this question of what defines a gentleman. And one of the three points, as you mentioned, that what were Conan Doyle's lodestars for gentlemanly behavior was absolute rectitude in financial matters. And the two had a vitriolic exchange of personal letters, some of which are quoted in the book, and then it, it escalated to open letters in the newspapers. It was the most painful outcome to this case where Conan Doyle had behaved absolutely heroically and absolutely morally. He was still, by his lights, behaving absolutely morally. And, of course, he couldn't really get his head around the fact that someone in Slater's situation who had been poor for so long, in prison for so long, and wronged so desperately might behave less than honorably and, and worse still, less than rationally. So eventually, Conan Doyle had to sue for the money. Fortunately, Slater's advisors prevailed on him to settle, and they prevailed on Conan Doyle to accept the settlement. So the case actually never went to trial. That would have been incredibly painful. And so by the time all of this was resolved, it well we're well into 1929. Conan Doyle has barely a year to live at that point. So it was really a very, very painful coda to this heroic case that came uh, very nearly at the end of Conan Doyle's life. It's, it's almost as if uh, Conan Doyle was seeing himself as some Pygmalion pen pal uh, that, that he wished to see Slater's uh, very character transform uh, simply That's by right. virtue of, of, a, of a letter writing uh, relationship that the two of them had they, because they only met in person once. And that That's was... exactly right. They met once when uh, in 1928 at the rehearing of the Slater's case to have his conviction quashed and uh, in Edinburgh. Conan Doyle traveled there from his home in the south of England to cover the case for a British newspaper. They met then, and at, at that point, things were still very cordial. Uh, and then after that, their relationship deteriorated, and Conan Doyle would, wrote Slater saying, you know, if indeed you persist in holding on to the money, you are a very foolish fellow, and I have no wish to know you further. Very, very painful painful stuff to read. Yeah. They had both grown up in strikingly similar circumstances, very poor, marginalized for their religion. Uh, Slater was a Jew, Conan Doyle a Roman Catholic. Really, both came from nothing, but as I say, one became a knight, the other became a knave, and at that point, the despite their similar origins, at that point, the social chasm between them was very nearly unbridgeable. Yeah, and it, yeah, I mean, it seems odd, you know, Conan Doyle knowing his character and, and in a few cases, um, you know, writing that, uh, he, almost that he, he turned up his nose at, at Slater, uh, acknowledging that he, uh, had some rather questionable judgment with regard to his livelihood. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but Conan Doyle still understood that justice should be blind and, uh, you know, he wanted to fight for him anyway. Knowing that, Knowing that Conan Doyle already had this um, predilection toward uh, looking down his nose at Slater for his station in life, one would have thought that Conan Doyle could see a little more clearly why Slater was being so difficult in the end. Well, he did eventually. It took time. I, I would argue uh, a different body part than the nose. I would argue that throughout his involvement with Slater, Conan Doyle didn't look down his nose because that he was too much of a gentleman to do. And again, one of his three tenets of tenets of gentlemanly behavior was you treat people in, at a lower station uh, the same as you. But he did hold Slater at arm's length. So I would say it's not the nose but the arm because people in that era, in the Victorian and Edwardian era, and even well into the 20th century, were very, very concerned. People of a certain social standing were very concerned with reputation. And I think the, the heartbreak 
is that the result of this stance of Conan Doyle's, this arm's length, this involved stance on the one hand, yet simultaneously arm's length stance on the other, was that he came to treat Slater more as a as an abstraction, you know, the the theoretical ideal of the wronged innocent, and that's someone worthy of crusading for, rather than a flesh and blood human being with human failings who, after 18 years in jail for a crime he didn't commit, would probably behave in a very irrational way and perhaps a a money-grubbing way. To his credit, in the second edition of his memoir, Memories and Adventures, published, uh, I think, not long before his death in the summer of 1930, looking back on the case as a kind of postscript, Conan Doyle says, I have now come to see how... Uh, someone who languished so long in jail might well have these ideas. So he did come to have a somewhat more charitable, nuanced, psychological view of Slater's behavior, but not at first. Well, that's 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 a shame that it took so long. I mean, it's, here's here's a a man, as you say, who was all about the tenets of what it meant to be a gentleman, and it, it's almost mm-hmm. as if his pride was ruined, and he was simply arguing. You know, that point of pride. I mean, 250 pounds. I mean, come on. Conan Doyle was a, uh, a, a wealthy man by that point. It certainly wasn't about the money by any stretch. No, it was about principle. And he felt that Slater had failed him, disappointed him because he was not acting in a principled way. Mm. It's like the most damning thing a parent or a teacher or authority figure can say to you right. if you've done something they don't like is not, you're behaving badly, but I'm so disappointed in you. It was that kind of stance. Had Conan Doyle been in that unfortunate position and been eventually released from prison, it would have been natural, according to his own code of honor, to recompense the people who would labored on his behalf. That's right. And Slater didn't. You know, there's a fine line between commendable crusading behavior and righteousness. And, you know, one doesn't even honorable people don't always come down on the right side of that line. And it is certainly with the benefit of historical hindsight, it's certainly possible to see Conan Doyle's stance as overly righteous in this case. As I said, he did mitigate his stance on Slater in his later memoir. One one thing, since you've read so widely, you know, one thing I, I wanted to comment, too, about the book is, is the fabulous references and notes and even a glossary of Scottish terms that you have to help your reader here. Um, But I'm curious, you know, you've read so widely and I notice in the references that you've delved into the Baker Street Journal in several articles. Do you think of yourself as a Sherlockian? And if not, what do you think about all of that, all of this writing on the writing? I flatter myself that I'm a sympathetic and, I hope, a congenial fellow traveler. I don't have the depth or the breadth of knowledge. Of course, I read the whole canon during the years I was working on the book. I took it with me on the plane to Scotland. Um, it was, the, I think, the Penguin, yeah, the Penguin one volume I'm looking at on all my shelf right now. I took it with me. I was working on the book so long, I was on jury duty twice, and, you know, so I was in the jury pool room with the canon. So, I went through it, but I certainly don't have the level of detail of knowledge that true adherents have. But again, being a journalist, for better or worse, is a kind of enfranchised trespass. And so I do hope that the community will feel a respectful and accurate trespasser. And I uh, have so far been quite warmly welcomed, for which I'm very grateful. That's funny that uh, having a copy of the complete Sherlock Holmes on your person does not disqualify you from jury duty. <laughs> well, I, would have, I would have thought you would have been immediately disqualified if you would have said, yes, Your Honor, you know, I'm busily working on someone who lab- languished in prison 18 years, falsely convicted. I'm writing a book about it. I would have thought you'd be out in the street in a minute. <laughs> It happened that uh, neither of the times I was on jury duty with that book was I actually impaneled, so I never ah. even got to that point in the voir dire. But indeed, <laughs> I do hope that uh, the master will get me out of jury duty from here on in, because I can say I wrote a book on a scandalous wrongful conviction, and I think cops and prosecutors are all monsters. So, <laughs> not, not really, of course, although in this case, they 
unequivocally were. The, well, the, the, yeah. the 1981 edition that you had, and I noticed it in the notes, um, and, and it was with you certainly uh, over the last six years, as, as you mentioned, working on the book. Uh, how how did that come into your possession? Was this a used bookstore uh, sale? Was it something that you bought during uh, you know your 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 time as uh, an early uh, early time in your journalism career? What, what, what's the story there? I just seem to have always had it. Maybe I was born with it. No, no, because I I antedate that by two decades. But um, I always say when I met my husband and we moved in together almost 35 years ago, it was not even so much a, a marriage or a cohabitation for us. It was a marriage of our two libraries. And we have uh, in New York, just for the two of us and one little cat, a three-bedroom duplex, and it's for the 20,000 books. So among the 20,000 were some from him, some from me, various editions of the canon, including the, the one-volume Penguin. Wow, that's great. Well, folks, if you would like to pick up a copy of the book, certainly it's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all the places you would normally expect to see it. Of course, Penguin Random House has uh, their own link as well. We will have links to all of those in the show notes. And uh, Margalit Fox, you can find her on Twitter at Margalit Fox, and you can find the book Conan Doyle for the Defense on Facebook as well. Before we let you go, Margalit, what's your next project? Well, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. It's also narrative nonfiction. Alas, I don't have the fiction gene. I wish I could have the luxury of just making stuff up, but I have no aptitude for that. It is narrative nonfiction. This one is a prisoner of war escape story. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds like a good, a good follow on to Conan Doyle for the defense. I, I think things do have a way of dovetailing rather seamlessly, and just as it's a good thing to get out of jail if you're wrongfully convicted, if you're in an enemy prison camp, it's a very, very fine thing indeed to be able to escape. <laughs> <laughs> well, we congratulate you on making it nearly an hour with us, and now is your chance to escape. Well, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. As I say, I really mean it. Of all of the podcasts I've been asked to be on or might be, uh, this is the one that makes me the happiest. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. And uh, it makes us very happy to have had this conversation with you. Well, thank you both very much. Thank you. Well, that was a great conversation. By the way, I have to point out before we before we talk about maybe a little bit more about the book that you and I have now spoken to someone who has spoken with the great 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 granddaughter. Keep going. What? Of bounty mutineer Fletcher Christian. What? <laughs> Is that so? Yeah, in um in in Marguerite's uh piece at the Times when she sort of summed up her career uh, on the eve of leaving the paper. She said, uh, this is the single greatest reward of writing obits, I've learned, is the chance to touch history. This was brought forcibly home to me in 2013 when I reported the obituary of a man named Tom Christian. Mr. Christian was the longtime chief radio operator on Pitcairn Island, responsible for keeping that speck of rock in the Pacific in contact with the world. As might be expected for someone from that place with that name, he was a direct descendant, the great-great-great-grandson of the bounty mutineer Fletcher Christian. And it's our policy to speak wherever possible with our subject's family. So I dialed Pitcairn, 6,000 miles from New York, and reached Mr. Christian's daughter, <laughs> who gave me in a lilting accent that to my uneducated ear sounded pure New Zealand, the biographical details I sought. And it, was, it wasn't until I hung up that I realized whom I'd been speaking to when I ran around the newsroom in high excitement, <laughs> shrieking, I just got off the phone with the great, 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 great granddaughter of Fletcher Christ Christian. <laughs> and you know what? It's not a movie. It's real. <laughs> That's something. Isn't that, that is something. isn't that great? Yeah. Well, you know, I, mm. I meant to ask Marguerite uh, what the most memorable obituary was that she wrote. I don't know if that would qualify or if there was something else that uh, 
was in her repertoire of, uh, as you say, over 1400 obituaries written. She covered that in the, in the story. Oh, she, she wrote in my 14 years in the job, I've had the immense moving privilege of sending off men and women who bore witness to major events in the 20th century. Also in a deeply pleasurable vein were obits for the inventors of the frisbee, the pet rock, etch a sketch. And she says, stovetop stuffing and the crash test dummy. <laughs> she says the, she, she recalls that the, obit for the inventor of the etch-a-sketch who's given the most wonderful headline design ever to grace a news obituary and the headline was a photograph of an etch-a-sketch with with the uh with with the headline i don't remember exactly what the headline said but it was something like you know inventor of etch-a-sketch dots wow which they had drawn on this on the top of a of an uh, (laughs) etch-a-sketch Well, the the beauty of an obituary on the etch a sketch is you just shake it around and you start from scratch. So, yes. Hmm. Well, why don't we get ourselves over to the newsroom and uh, see what we can unearth? Yes. Well, it looks like uh, you had you had shared a link with me uh, that there is a. Uh, a movie coming out based on Stephen King's The Doctor's Case. Yes, it's due September 1st, and I picked this up. I can't remember where. I, I'd been at the Priory Scholars meeting last Saturday or so, and I wasn't familiar with the story, but apparently the gist of this is, I believe, I, what I've been told is that Stephen King permits one story of his a year to be dramatized. Oh. And this particular short story called The Doctor's Case is the subject, and it will be available uh, on the 1st of September. And it is described as uh, Stephen King's non-canonical gift to the Sherlock Holmes multiverse. He wrote it originally for an anthology called The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, and it was then republished. But the premise is that Dr. Watson, who's now in his 90s, is relating to the reader a story of the one and only time he can recall solving a case before his uh, his famous companion. Now, of course, inaccurately, the story tells us, and it's obviously a Stephen King story, so it isn't really by Watson, tells us that Holmes at this point has been dead for 40 years. Oh, well, that's... Uh, and it's a locked room murder mystery, and apparently this dramatization stars uh, among the cast Denise Crosby, who many will remember from uh, Star Trek: The uh, Next Generation, uh, among others. Well, I'm I'm pleased to know that Watson could uh, solve the case when Holmes was dead for forty years. I'm, I'm glad he solved it before Holmes. No, I know it's being told in retrospect. Um, this this. Uh, story actually uh and and i i the reason i'm aware of this is because uh, someone in uh, a comment thread i can't remember if it was here on the i hear of sherlock everywhere website or it was over on the trifles website commented uh, about stephen king and sherlock holmes now perhaps it was a comment that we received uh in email from warren nast he uh wrote to us to say um I want to share an I hose moment and I hear of Sherlock everywhere moment in the new Stephen King novel, The Outsider on page 205 where the character quotes, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable must be the truth. And then there's a zinger about Arthur Conan Doyle believing in fairies. And Warren wrote to ask, do you know that Stephen King has a pastiche in this book of short stories called The Doctor's Case? Uh, uh, in, in the book called Nightmares and Dreamscapes. And that was in fact included in, uh, in Nightmares and Dreamscapes, but it was also first included in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, uh, the centennial edition that uh, was authorized by the Conan Doyle estate in 1987, uh, where the doctor's case first appeared. Perfect, perfect, uh, book ending there. Yeah, very good. I take it you, you, like I, have never read the story. I have not. No, but now uh, I, I I feel like I should to to prepare. 
Well, you can wait for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. I can. Uh, but in other news, uh, this was blasted all over the uh, Sherlockian world on the 20th. Uh, the Baker Street Irregulars have finally entered the 21st century. I know we're, we're almost a quarter of the way through it, and, and the BSI has its own website now, BakerStreetIrregulars.com, which, of course, you heard in uh, our intro and in the ad for the Baker Street Journal. Um, it, it's been a long time coming. It brings together the BSI Press, the Baker Street Journal, all the events that the BSI does. Uh, and, um, well, the BSI Trust still has its own standalone website. But now we have kind of uh, the umbrella of branding for uh, the Baker Street Irregulars and everything that they are um, cranking out. So Now, does this, this mean I can no longer use my... Um 2400 baud modem to get to the Baker Street Regulars BBS. Oh, you can still do that, and and you can still write them letters on a typewriter, and it'll take about the same amount of time to connect. <laughs> either way, <laughs> good. But uh, this great. was a long time coming, and uh, Randall Stock oversaw the efforts. You know, it's absolutely wonderful to see this and to see the Irregulars really uh, updating a site that, frankly, it, whose architecture went back 17 years. You know, I, I was actually the business manager for the Baker Street Journal at the time and convinced Mike that if you're going to sell a CD-ROM to people who need computers to use a CD-ROM, then it might make sense to offer them the ability to buy it online. And um, it, it, it was all I could do to, um, you know, throw this website together. I am not a website guru by any stretch of the imagination, but we put it together and it stuck uh, for quite some time. I handed over the reins to, to Randall in 2008 and he has updated it since then. And it just got to a breaking point where, uh, other things had to be done. And so here we are. Well, that's very canonical, you know, 17 years in the making. That's one year for every step on the way. <laughs> yes. From the street up to the sitting room in Baker Street. I like that. I like that a lot. Well, I think we are all out of news, and that means it's time to see if we can oh, give away some quiz prizes, shall we? That means it's time for Canonical Couplets. We, of course, had a number of entries last time, and you may recall that the last Canonical Couplet went something like this. From this important record, it appears that Holmes was pretty good at 60 years. Want to hazard a guess on that one, Bert? Oh, that's um, the Mazarin Band, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you're narrowing it down. You're getting closer every time here. Uh, it was, in fact, his last bow. We met Sherlock Holmes as, uh, quote-unquote, a man of 60 in his last bow, which was very clearly set in 1914. So we are going to spin the random number generator, put the names in the barrel here and give it a big push right around. And it looks like it's coming to rest on number three. Number three. And that is, why, it's Rob Nunn. Uh, previous guest on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Rob, congratulations. We're going to be sure to get you something that uh, would highlight or, or fill out your Sherlockian collection from our little treasure trove here. We'll be in touch. And that, of course, means that now it's time for the canonical couplet for episode 149. And here we go. It's better, lads to stay at home and cram than pilfer questions of the Greek exam. If you think you know which story this canonical couplet refers to, then please jot us a note, send it to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com and put canonical couplet in the subject line. Good luck. Excellent. I think that just about does it this time around. It's amazing we've made it this far. It is. You know, we're getting closer and closer to 150 episodes. 
That is right. Well, this is Scott Monty. Until until next time, I remain less than sesquicentennial. <laughs> well, until next time, I remain less than Les Klinger. <laughs> I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be my dear fellow. Very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. You, I just have to tell you, it's a great book. You know, you've got so much in here, including the best explanation of Holmes' deductive method. You know, Charles oh, Person, so abductive please. reasoning, which, right, because uh, which I've ever what, read. You know, why the hell is it even called, and a brilliant question that my editor Hillary asked, because we're so used to, oh, yeah, Conan Doyle just called it deduction. And she said, well, why did he if he knew that wasn't it wasn't a deductive process? And, of course, the answer is he just did. But, but yeah, that's fascinating when you realize it's not deduction. It's the opposite of deduction. <laughs> <laughs>